If you're tired and bored of just sitting around the house in these COVID times, get off your butt and build a bee house. I decided to do one of these this week. In addition to the two bat houses and kestrel house I just built, I have wanted to do another one of these for quite a while. I built one years ago, but it's an old one. A bee house, what exactly is it? Why do bees need houses? Well, these are designed specifically to attract solitary bees. Solitary bees live on their own. There's no queen bee involved. There's no hive involved. There's no honey making involved by these bee species. In Canada, there's over 800 species or even a thousand potential species of solitary bees. These bees typically seek out cavities to lay their eggs. And these can be in hollow logs, they can be in other chunks of wood, under debris of various types, and in the ground as well. So that's one feature they all have in common, these solitary bees, is they're nesting in different cavity forms. So a bee house attempts to provide that structural element that the, these bees need. Now across the world, these native bee species and by the way, I should say that the honey bee that everyone knows is not a native species to North America. It was introduced here many years ago for the production of honey. All these solitary bees, or most of the solitary bees we have, are actually native species. So it's good to encourage or to help them along. And they are declining around the world for various reasons, but the main ones being habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, and also pesticide use. So again, it may be important now to provide more artificial nesting structures such as these. These can range in size from large to small. As if you search online, you'll see the whole gamut from tiny little structures to big full wall size structures. The important thing is to simply provide a number of nesting hole sizes and uh, diversity of uh, habitat or structural types within your box perhaps if you'd like to. You'll see that too online where you'll see a box like this may be divided up into numerous compartments that offers different types of substrate for them to nest in and that's an interesting way to go. This particular one I mainly am using the same structure throughout the whole main compartment here. I may put some other type of material up in these two sections. Anyhow as far as the important things you need to know if you're simply using holes like I have into solid wood. These are 4x4 four four red pine blocks that I, I cut from a log I had, a squared log, a squared timber. I cut down into 10 inch segments. And the hole sizes here, I've used a range of hole sizes from about an eighth of an inch wide to half a, an inch wide. And the important thing here is to make them as deep as you can but not go through the other side of whatever type of timber or square log or solid wood you're using. And you want to make them anywhere from three to six inches deep. The larger hole sizes should go deeper, but you don't want to go out the other side of the log either. You don't want to penetrate the other side. You want to leave one side closed. So in this case where these timbers were four inches square roughly, I, I would go in for the deeper holes, maybe to three and a half to three and three quarter inches deep. Or I might have been able to get near four inches. Some of them are a bit bigger than four inches. So some of the solitary bee types we have include groups such as mason bees, which typically use mud and wet earth to create their cellular structures in here. Leaf cutter bees, which chew up leaves to make their uh, building materials. Then there's cellophane bees, which use sap-like components to create their cells. Um, carpenter bees, which chew up wood and stuff. So there's quite a range of groups, as I mentioned, over 800 species in Canada alone. So the basic biology is that they will find a cavity like this, the female. If she likes it, she'll go in and lay eggs along its length anywhere from 1 to 22 eggs, or 20 eggs roughly. And each egg is given a bit of pollen to feed on, and then the cell is, that cell is compartmentalized. The female will create a wall structure to uh, um, separate it from the next egg she lays. 
So you'll have a bunch of segments along these chambers with individual eggs. They gradually grow over the summer, turn into larvae, and then into then they'll pupate and go into their cocoons for the winter. And then the next spring, as the temperatures raise, those individual young uh, bees will uh, hatch from the pupil cases or the cocoons and then they'll come out the end. They'll chew off the end cap here which is usually a cap of mud or a cap of vegetative debris that's been chewed up into a saliva type structure. So they'll emerge. That's sort of the life cycle of these solitary bees. So by having a range of sizes of holes you have a greater chance of getting a range of species, quite a range of species, from tiny little micro bees to fairly large, almost honey bee size like uh, species. So that's a good thing if you're using this approach. Now they also sell nesting trays, what are known as sort of, they call them mason bee nesting trays usually, and it's basically just slabs of wood stacked on top of each other and they have the channels cut into them successively on each layer. Oftentimes the holes will overlap between layers. So half of the hole will be in one plank and half, half of the hole will be in the other plank, as you can see here in this illustration. And then uh, people will, in October or late fall, they'll open those up and they'll take the cocoons out of the chamber bring those into their house and store them in the refrigerator for the winters and then in the spring they'll collect those cocoons and put them outside in a dish or something and maybe up in a place like this or some sheltered location where birds and things aren't going to get at them and then as the warm air surrounds them for a day or two or whatever it takes they'll start to emerge out of there and I guess the theory there is that you can have greater success of rearing the young by doing that as opposed to just leaving them into the into the in the nesting box itself. Now in this case where I've got solid log they'll have to go through the whole process themselves. You can't get in here and examine the various chambers like you can with the nesting trays. So when you have your nesting box created you can think of a box of this size which is sort of a medium-sized box I guess. You could build smaller, you could have it half of this size. You could even just have a piece of this, a piece of log like this and stick it up on the side of a building and that could be a bee house because they'll still use the holes. You don't have to have this, but a typical bee house, generally a frame of wood, in this case one by six inch pine and then one by 10 inch pine for the roof just so it has a significant overhang to protect it from the rain. And then I've used a few chunks of cedar deck board strips to hold my blocks in here and a bit of cedar up here in the roof area. I've used a backing board of 3 8 inch plywood and then I painted the exterior portions of the box with exterior latex acrylic paint. You don't want to paint the nesting structures themselves, the, the wood of any type you don't want to paint. You also don't want to use uh, pressure treated wood because the chemicals might negatively affect the young as they develop. So you've got the frame and then the roof Typically a box like this you could have separated into several compartments. For example, I could have put a dividing board here and maybe one going up and down too and then I could have had four compartments that I could have tested or just offered four different types of substrate. I could have had logs like this in one, a whole bunch of twigs piled together sticking in and out. I could have had bamboo steak, other debris, corrugated cardboard. People use, have used all kinds of different structural materials to put in their different compartments. And it's interesting just to test it out to see which bees might be attracted to the different types of structure. So that's a fun thing to do, especially if you have kids. They could treat it almost like an experiment. Anyhow, I did forget to mention, I think, uh, when you go to erect this, a good option is on the side of a shed or a building, a garage, for example, the side of your house if you can attach it there, but it should face south or southeast to catch in the northern hemisphere. South or south, southeast to catch the morning midday sun, that's what the bees like. Now you can also put it on a pole if you don't have access to um, a building side or that's appropriate up at about four to five feet in height. I hope you'll give it a try. 
and we can hopefully help out our solitary bee native species and uh, probably didn't even mention that, that fact there's so many facts here they're one of the more efficient pollinators of the bees out there apparently even more efficient than honeybees or bumblebees uh, partly probably because there's so many species of them but also the range of sizes that they come in they can pollinate many different types of plants especially if you're putting up a bee house try to get it close to your gardens because uh, they'll help to pollinate your gardens you may also get occasionally in these houses parasitic wasps that will nest in these holes so they'll uh, sometimes come in and they're good for your gardens too because they'll help to rid your gardens of some of the pest insects by parasitizing on those pest insects. So that's all interesting things you can do when you get a bee house. Just simply put it up and observe and learn. Hope you'll give it a try. Thanks.